The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, and happy Friday. Welcome to another CBBC Digital Consumer Webinar Series 2020. We all have our webcams on switched, switched on today, and hopefully you should be able to see myself, Kevin, and Johan. They're going to be our speakers for today. Our topic is China cross-border e-commerce, routes to market, and logistics flow. And I'm joined today by Kevin Rogers from Elanders and Johan Oladal from Aventura. Very quickly, some housekeeping, just to make sure everybody can hear and see me. You can have a panel like this on your screen and a little hand button. If I could ask you to just click the hand button, that will let me know that everything is working and you can see my screen. I see a hand going up. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. And I've also circled here our questions box. I really want to encourage everybody to ask questions throughout. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A at the end and we'll try to get all your questions answered. So don't be shy. And if you have a burning question, please do type it in. Also very quickly, an introduction to CBC for those of you who don't know. CBC, we are the China Britain Business Council. We are the leading organization supporting UK China trade. Here in the UK, we have offices across the country and we also operate in different industry sectors. So here on the consumer team, we support the agriculture, food and drink and the retail sectors. We also have 13 offices across China. These cover all of first year cities. That's Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou and Shenzhen. And our wonderful China team over there are supporting UK businesses on the ground, breaking into the China market. And as I always say, every time this is our series, so we have lots of webinars coming up for you. On the 5th of May, we'll be hearing from Connect Plus. And on the 19th, we will be focusing on something slightly different, B2B digital marketing, and that's with Crayfish. And then into June, we will have a food and drink focused webinar with Ken. CBC, we're also offering a 30 minute free CMBA uh, consultation service, and you can find more about this on the website. But for today, I would like to introduce our speakers. So we have Kevin Rogers from Elanders. Kevin has been employed at Elander since 1999 and has filled roles in manufacturing, operations management, sales and marketing, global supply chain, and a member of the group ma management team. He has experience working in the UK, Czech Republic, and of course, China. And today, Kevin is joined by Johan Oladal. Oh, I struggle with the last name. <laughs> he is um, starting on the supplier side to build e-com solutions, both in Sweden and of course, China. For the past 10 years, Johan has operated in China and Southeast Asia, offering China market entry and growth solutions. He's been working with brands flagship stores on both Tmall and JD since 2013. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to our specialist for today. This is Kevin and Johan. Okay, let's get started. So good morning, everyone. First of all, thanks to CBBC for the opportunity to present today. We will be covering every aspect of cross-border e-commerce and logistics. And our aim today is really quite simple. It's two things. By sharing the information, firstly, we want to give you a good understanding of the cross-border e-commerce market and what you need to consider and do before entering the market. So as Maxine explained, there are two presenters today. Um, Maxine did a great introduction. So I guess the only thing left for me to, to explain is that um, I got my understanding of the China market um, from by spending four years there. And I returned back to the UK from China last summer. But if, essentially, Alanders are a global business. We operate in 20 different countries and we provide supply chain, print and packaging, and e-commerce related services. Johan, would you like to add to your introduction? Yeah, so, hello everybody. Morning, UK. Uh, I'm sitting in Hong Kong here today. I'm usually uh, sharing my time between Hong Kong and Shanghai. Now I've been in Hong Kong for a couple of months due to the current situation, as we all are, are aware of. Uh, I'm on one of the four partners in Aventura. Uh, we are working both with China, Hong Kong and Vietnam, but mostly for sure in, in China. Uh, and uh, we are trying to act as a one-stop shop with a few outsourcing partners. Maybe the next slide will give a little bit more details, Kevin. Absolutely. So the reason why there are two presenters today is Elanders and Aventura have formed a partnership 
to provide end-to-end cross-border e-commerce services. So I can explain the responsibilities from Melendez and Johan will explain responsibilities from Aventura. There are two very clear areas of expertise. Um, Elanders do all of the logistics um, and custom support and so on. We have facilities in the UK and China. They're both key markets for us. So responsibilities within the partnership from a Landers perspective is UK project management. There's the global and the local logistics services. We also have a trading license in China. So occasionally we, we can buy and sell with our customers. It's not our normal business, but we, we do do that occasionally. UK and China are key markets, as I explained. We do have our own facilities in both uh, countries, so we can provide the local China fulfillment and logistics services with our own team on the ground. And another important part of any e-commerce business is the return service, which Elanders can manage through our domestic warehouses. Johan? Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, Aventura, we have, as I said, offices over here in China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and we don't have any uh, location or, or representation in Europe. And that's why we feel the Landes collaboration is so so good for everybody here, <laughs> both parties. Uh, we are entering various market partnerships with both consumer brands and the industrial brands who are entering China and also, of course, would like to grow in China. Uh, it can be everything from initial market research to recruit certain key key person in, in the in the Chinese team. Um, what we will talk here about today mostly is to, to set up and run your e-commerce in China, could be both domestic. Today we'll talk mostly about cross-border uh, e-commerce. Uh, we also do other services like customer service and we can help to set up uh, your local Chinese company to run your local accounting, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm trying to have a holistic approach, a holistic collaboration with, with the brand owner. And in quite many cases, we are running this in a so-called BOT model, build, operate, and transfer. So after a few years, when, when the brand owner is ready to do this by themselves, we, we are transferring the business back to the brand owner, if that's the wish and plan, or we continue for that additional five, 10 years or so. So uh, we, we covered quite a lot. Uh, we, as I said before, we are outsourcing the logistic uh, <coughs> to Elanders, um, and that is uh, working very good, I would say. Um, we've been doing this in China for 10 years. Um, yeah, I think that's a good summary. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Johan. So the topics we're going to cover today, as Maxine explained, it is about the routes to market for cross-border e-commerce. We're going to cover other aspects such as fulfillment options. We're going to touch on customs clearance, tax and duty. I'm not a tax expert, but my colleagues on the ground in China keep me right in terms of regulations. Uh, we look at the logistics flow and also the opportunities for UK brands and we we'll close with a short summary. We're gonna do our very best to keep it within the one hour today. There is a lot of content, so depending on questions at the end, it may run over a little. But to have any success, any chance of succeeding in China, there are some key first steps you could take, and Johan will cover these steps on the next slide. Yeah, uh, based on experience here, uh, in quite many, too many cases, we, we've been facing a situation where the brand owner hasn't registered a trademark for the Chinese market. So, so, so that's something, is, it's a small detail in today's topic, but it's really important. As soon as you start to think about China, make sure that you have or, it's, or you start to apply for the Chinese trademark. It can go everything from two two months to one and a half years. So if you're unlucky, it can take some time and, and, and it will be a bottleneck if you don't have this one. Or I would say if you don't have a trademark, you can't really do it. So so that's super important. Uh, I will come back to this later, but do your homework. Uh, China is different. You heard this one million times, but it really is. Um, you need to have some kind of China strategy plan in terms of sales and marketing before you enter, before you start your investment in China. The customers might be different. Your assortment might work differently in China. Sales channels is always a jungle. Where should we sell, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so try to recruit some kind of partnership with somebody and, and do market research uh, or feasibility study. Um, Find a partner um, that's 
you can't really handle this from UK. Uh, you, you must have somebody on the ground in China uh, of many reasons. So, so to find one or several local partners, it's another key component. Thanks, Johan. And just to, to add to that, certainly in my experience of uh, understanding the China market and talking to uh, many companies who have actually entered China and then ended up exiting, one of the main contributing factors was they didn't do their homework properly. They didn't do the research, or maybe in some cases, they even worked with the wrong partner and they didn't have the visibility of, of activities on the ground. So as Johan explained, these are all very important steps to take before entering the market. Now, it is very easy to get excited about China, and there are good reasons for that. Um, first of all, the numbers are absolutely staggering. So if we just take a look at some of the, the data here. So in 2019, total cross-border e-commerce reached the level of 70.7 .7 billion pounds. That's for all cross-border e-commerce activities in China. And that was an increase of 21% compared to 2018. And there is estimated to be 800 million Chinese consumers accessing the internet via mobile devices. So like I said, staggering numbers. If we look at the UK, uh, UK exports to China were worth 22.6 billion in 2019. I don't have the breakdown of, of cross-border e-commerce business and general trade, but it's still a significant number. And I think China is the UK's fifth or sixth largest trading partner currently. And I think with Brexit on the horizon, then what I'm hearing on the ground here in the UK is that there is a bigger appetite to generate more trade between the UK and China. So it's very easy to get excited, but you have to be realistic. To establish a business, your brand in China, it will take between two to three years. So it's best to have that expectation and understanding before you start. That's from a perspective of your brand not being known in China, no sales channels in China, it will take two to three years. And another thing to understand is that in terms of e-commerce, within China, it is dominated by the marketplaces, which are also known as platforms. So if you think of Amazon, then this is how most of the, uh, the platforms operate. And Johan will explain platforms, the role of TPs, and how payments work on the following slides. Over to you, Johan. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, yes, as Kevin said there, uh, e-commerce in China is really all about marketplaces, both when it comes to domestic e-commerce and cross-border e-commerce. Uh, uh, to set up your own website, uh, and try to reach the Chinese consumers, it's a huge challenge. Then you need also a huge marketing budget. Uh, all the traffic are, are always on the marketplaces. When it comes to, to cross-border e-commerce, uh, number one is, is uh, Alibaba, as more or less in, in all e-commerce aspect in China. Uh, Tmall Global, there's two Tmall, one Tmall Classic, Tmall.com and Tmall.hk, which is called Tmall Global, which is, is the number one. Uh, and I would say that's uh, in general, uh, it always depends a little bit on about your category, your assortment, but, but in general, Tmall Global is, is uh, what people usually recommend uh, as, a, as a start. Uh, Alibaba acquired Koala here a while ago, uh, so, so number two is also owned by Alibaba. So, so Alibaba is kind of owning half of the, of the whole market there. JD uh, is, uh, is number two also in, in the domestic e-commerce and also here in, 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 the, in the global, I mean, in the cross-border e-commerce. Uh, VIP Shop and Pindudu are some, some smaller players, but there are a bunch of, of marketplaces here. Uh, and all of them are working fairly similar uh, in terms of you set up a shopping shop and the, uh, you need a local team who, run, who is running the local store, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, there are some, can be some bottlenecks, some hurdles in terms of setting up a team or global store. And for in certain, in some categories, there can be some uh, deposit for quite big deposit that you need to pay to Alibaba before you can open the store. Um, and, and these kind of investments can of course be uh, an issue sometimes. And then social commerce, e-commerce based on the social media platforms in China is growing rapidly nowadays. Um, so that's an, that's an optional way to enter China, I would say, either with the WeChat store or a, 
Little Red Bookstore. Concept is similar, uh, but in these cases, you work more with influencer marketing. So suitable for certain categories. Some other categories may be still better to go with Timon Global, um, but there's still, still an option today. It's not only marketplaces, but also social commerce uh, coming quite quickly. And I, I would say now with Corona, this is growing even more. Uh, where influencers are getting a bigger and bigger part of the digital market in China. We can go to the next one, maybe, um, Kevin. So, uh, to run a store in China, and this is, I would say, regardless of, especially for marketplaces, but also social commerce, you need a local partner. Uh, and the word for this is TP. It's coming from Taobao back in the days, but now also Tmall partner, TP. Uh, and that's the word for your local e-commerce partner. Uh, a local Chinese company who is running your store in China. Um, <clears throat> that, that includes both setting up the store, but also to run it on a daily basis, maintenance. Um, a TP usually provides services like, like a web design, store operation, online merchandising, customer service. Some TPs also include the whole logistic uh, package. Uh, but most of the TPs, they, they have collaboration with, with another company, like we have with, with the Landers, for example. Um, so the, the, the mindset is that the brand owner should see this as your extended arm in China, your, your online department in China. Um, you as brand owner uh, must invest in marketing, and also you have the inventory responsibility. Uh, it's quite a workforce heavy in terms of, of, of team and staff. Uh, the, the TPs are working seven days a week, especially with the customer service, which is crucial part, uh, usually until midnight every day. Uh, and I would say between 50 and 70% of all the orders are going via the customer service. Consumers tend to, they would like to negotiate and uh, talk to somebody before they place an order to build up a trust feeling that, okay, this feels okay, now I place the order. Uh, one of the major tasks for TP is to be the link between you in Europe or the brand and the marketplace owner, and usually Alibaba in this case. Uh, the, so the store manager uh, from the TP is in a daily contact with, uh, with Alibaba in terms of negotiating about uh, traffic, about the next up, uh, upcoming campaign, uh, what will happen in, in May, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is crucial, and of course, also. Uh, a big challenge if you're sitting in Europe, if you can't maybe speak Chinese, you are in another time zone, you need to act quickly. Um, so, so this is one of the major reasons why you need a TP uh, to communicate with the marketplaces. Uh, another thing is that most of the interface is in Chinese. So even if you have, you know everything about e-commerce and you have a lot of experience from Amazon, etc., uh, it can be tricky to understand how it works in the back office. I think those you know, are the major Yeah, Kevin. Sorry, I, I, I guess another important point to make is the understanding of the Chinese consumers and the Chinese consumer behavior is very different to uh, European consumer behavior. Exactly, of, of course. Um, so so, so that, that's um, the hygiene factor that you need somebody in China who understands how the consumers are thinking how and how they behave. Uh, and, and link that together with, with your store's offer and, and the, the campaign management, more or less. So um, a local partner is essential to, to, to both set up and also to run the store. Next slide. I, I guess one last thing here. Um, if you have both the Tmall store and maybe store on WeChat and, and the JD, etc., if you have several stores in China, usually uh, you have one TP who run all the e-commerce. That, that's a normal setup. So, so it can be a little bit messy if you have one TP for JD, one TP for Alibaba. Um, usually you have, you have one partner doing this. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the major advantages with cross-border uh, e-commerce um, is, is the, the payment flow. Um, it, it is... As the brand owner, when you have a, a flagship store on, for example, Timo Global, uh, then you are the all, more or less all the customers are using Alibaba's own payment gateway called uh, Alipay. Uh, and then basically uh, the, the, the incoming uh, income is coming to your Alipay account, and then they are 
uh, convert it to your local currency and then send link to your bank account overseas. So, so when you're talking about doing business in China, one common problem or question is how do I get the money out of China uh, with cross-border e-commerce? E e uh, that's a part of the concept. You, you always get out the money. You can't really collect the money in China. You must collect it outside. Uh, so, so that's one of the big advantages. It's easy. Perfect. Thanks, Johan. So we've shared information related to China markets, platforms, TPs, and payments. And I'm sure the, the order fulfillment flow is interesting to, to all of you. So let's take a look. Um, this is the, the symbol view. And we will go into more detail on, on the next slides. But essentially, from a full order fulfillment perspective, there are two, two options. There is what is called the direct shipping model or there's the bonded warehouse model. Now, let's take a, just a, a quick walk through because it all, everything starts with the, the order being placed on the, the marketplace stores. So if you're taking the direct shipping model, then the goods would be sitting in the UK. So they would be picked and packed and shipped one by one, and, and that's normally done by air freight because of the lead time. And then once it arrives in China, it drops into the domestic delivery to the consumers. The bonded warehouse model is something slightly different. It begins in the same way the order is placed, except with the bonded warehouse model, the picking and the packing and the, the shipping out is actually done in China. So that's then clears, clears customs from the free trade zone and then dropped into the domestic delivery. Uh, network. So a more detailed view will show the key steps in terms of and integration and other key points to note. So the Chinese consumer finds your brand, finds your product and places the order. The order details are sent to two places. Now this is all managed from the platforms directly. So details are sent to both China Customs and also sent to the fulfillment company. I'll come back to the China customs in a moment. So the order is fulfilled and packed. The shipping data, depending on which method you're using, is sent to the consumer. And then the order is shipped to China and clears customs as part of the process. And coming back to the China customs, the reason why China customs receive the data is because occasionally they do spot checks. And the order details sent to China Customs and the order information that's sent with the package must match up. If there are any issues there, there could be a possibility where the order gets stuck in customs. All being well, the goods are then released and delivered to the consumer. The delivery information is logged back into the system, so that completes the loop. So you have full traceability of the, the process. And the only other thing to think about is what happens if the consumer receives your goods and there's a problem, whatever it may be, how, how and where do they return those goods to? But in terms of the flow and the integration points, the marketplace store will connect to the brand owner. So you get visibility of what order has been placed and what you need to, to, uh, to ship out. That will naturally be connected to your warehouse and fulfillment system and also with the courier network that you're using. There are some other important points to note. And the probably the most important thing is that you have to provide the commercial invoice and packing list with the shipment. And that comes back to the China customs issue. It's really important that the, the paperwork the information on the packing list matches the order 100%. So again, just to make sure that, that you get a, a smooth process. China labeling is something that is also required and that can be either on the product or it can be translated and made available on the, on the platform. It's important to select, select the right shipping service. Track and trace nowadays is normally a standard, but it is important. And also something else I touched on earlier, you, you have to really consider your reverse or your returns logistics. So giving the consumer the option to send the goods back for whatever reason. 
And if there is any issue at customs, the shipper and the store owner are notified. So you're not blind to it, but you need to have a process in place to be able to manage that should that happen. And when volumes grow, hopefully you can generate a successful business in China. You, you should really look at a more cost-effective and efficient option compared to the direct shipping model. And this is where the bonded warehouse model can really play an important role. So that covers the order fulfillment flow. It's also useful to know a little about customs and tax regulations. So a core part of the, the cross-border model is that the platforms connect to China Customs as we've seen from the, the fulfillment flow. That is needed because China Customs uh, it has to be registered, but they also need the ability to track that digitally. So the key things that are required to be sent are shipment details, payment details, and the order details itself. And a question that, that is asked uh, on a regular basis is, is there a need to register with the China inspections and quarantine when shipping cross-border? And that really depends because the direct shipping model, personal parcel route as it's also known, there is no need for CIQ clearance. However, with the bonded warehouse model, goods do need CIQ clearance. Again, you, you shouldn't need to worry about that too much, and I'll come on to that in the, in the next slides because your fulfillment partner um, should be managing that for you. So the two models, direct shipping and bonded warehouse model. So let's take a, a look at, in terms of what the regulations mean for the two, the two options. So firstly, direct shipping. Benefits with the direct shipping model is that the package, packages don't need to be checked or taxed. That will only happen if there is a spot check by customs. And I can safely say that at least 99% of all packages that are shipped cross-border do not are not subject to a spot check. If there is a spot check and there is any issue with VAT, then that will automatically be, well, that's the responsibility of the consumer, should I say, and that is paid by the consumer before the package is collected. So some of the other, some of the benefits really is packages are rarely checked, all taxes are paid by the consumer. There's no need to stock any goods in China because you're shipping one by one from the UK. There is also a tax exemption if the value is less than 50 RMB. And there is the need, no need for CIQ clearance. However, there are some disadvantages by shipping uh, one by one. Because you're shipping the parcels one at a time, then you end up shipping more parcels internationally, which results in higher costs per parcel. And also it results in longer lead times because you're shipping from the UK to China. And the lead times can be anything between seven to 30 days in worst cases. But Chinese consumers can still uh, be very happy buying on this model because it reduces or significantly reduces the risk of receiving any fake goods, which is unfortunately still a problem today in, in, in the e-commerce space. And another point to note, which is the, the final point on the slide, is that if Chinese consumers, I guess, as with every consumers around the world, lead time is vitally important. So if they're having to wait seven to, up to 30 days, then that sometimes can be an issue. So if you're looking to play the long game for cross-border e-commerce, then it's sensible to aim for a better long-term solution. So now the bonded warehouse model. So a bonded warehouse sits inside what is called a free trade zone, otherwise known as an FTZ. So even though the warehouse is on the Chinese mainland, because it's in the free trade zone, all of the goods in the warehouse are classified as being outside of China. So there's no need to clear any customs when the goods are, are, are landing and being put into the free trade zone warehouse. The goods can move freely within the free trade zone and even be transported back overseas, so back to the UK or to another market without having to pay any China tax or duty. Another advantage of the bonded warehouse is you can use that as an Asia hub. So if you're serving more than the Chinese market, say you're serving Japan, Korea, you can ship 
store goods in the free trade zone and ship to those other markets on demand. Similar to the, uh, the direct shipping model, any tax or duty is paid by the, the consumers and that's uh, built into the, the retail price. Compared to direct shipping, the bonded warehouse lead times are, are between two to four days. And that also includes any time required for CIQ clearance. So significantly better than the direct shipping model. The next two points are for information only. This is just to share some tax rates uh, for regular or normal products. And also there is an extra consumption tax for some luxury products. And that's applied if the value exceeds uh, more than 10 RMB per gram or milliliter. Now that is a case by case. And also I will say regulations change, which is again where you need to follow the regulations closely yourself or whether your partner on the ground in China can manage that for you and keep you up to speed of, of any changes there. And as I mentioned, the consumption taxes, if that is applied, then that's paid by the consumer and that's already built into the, the product pricing. So hopefully that was useful. There is a link at the end of the, uh, the presentation for you to log into the source of this data and you can do your own homework just to get a better understanding but essentially this doesn't affect your business because it's already built into the model. Now there are currently some limitations on consumers for purchasing goods cross-border. There's a per transaction limitation of 5,000 RMB and there's also an annual limitation of 26,000 RMB. Again, this is all taken care of within the, uh, within the model through passing the information electronically within the China uh, customs. So just to summarize and compare the two, so direct shipping, the one by one service, it is very simple. There's no need to hold any goods in China. It's a one by one service. And therefore, when you add up the total cost of all the shipments, it can be more expensive. The lead times are longer than the, the bonded warehouse model and there's no need for CIQ clearance. So this can be a good starting point. So rather than ship your goods to China in bulk, you can do it one by one, but as it grows, then moving to the bonded warehouse model is probably the sensible approach. And this is where obviously the warehouse is located in the free trade zone. You could use that as an Asia hub. The big upside is much shorter lead times. You don't need to worry about any tax or duty. Um, and also there is CIQ clearance required, but again, that will be taken care of uh, by your, your partner. So that's the most, much more effective and cost-effective solution uh, in terms of a longer term plan. So hopefully you found those insights useful. What we also wanted to highlight, but what we see as the key considerations to take when entering the China market. Johan and I will share this slide and Johan will, will take the first section. I'll join in the middle and then hand back to Johan to finish it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. So on the marketplaces uh, in China, the, the most common way to enter those marketplaces as a brand owner is to set up a flagship store. <clears throat> uh, there are mostly, of course, advantages with that. Um, if you look on the consumer side, when the search for your product or your, your category on the marketplaces, search engines, if they get several options for the same product, they tend to choose the flagship store product It feel, in terms of trust. and uh, um, So in terms of sales, the flagship stores tend to have better sales than, than multi-brand stores. Um, of course, you can have your whole assortment there. The flagship stores are usually belonging to one certain category. Both Alibaba and JD are working very much almost individually, category by category. So when you have one category, then you talk to that category manager and negotiate with them on a daily basis. And it's difficult maybe to work with several categories, uh, especially on, on a high level uh, as, a, as a brand owner. Uh, but the downside is slightly more uh, deposit, a little bit more fees to build the store and you are on your own <laughs> so you need, really need your local good partner to, to run the store thanks johan and there is a another opportunity 
and it, it, it could be a collaboration opportunity for multiple CBBC members. And I touched on it earlier, it's called an umbrella store. And Aventura have um, first-hand experience of this. They call it their Kaimen model, and they've launched this for Swedish brands. Kaimen means open door in Mandarin. So this is the open door to the China market. And it could be a cost-effective way to, to start if the, the cost of having your own flagship store is prohibitive in terms of entering the China market. So this is a store that can have multiple brands. It can also have multiple products. And the big benefit is you could share the shed up, the share the setup costs and maintenance costs of the ongoing costs for the store. And if you think of this as an, an incubator option, it allows you to get a first step into the market. And if you're successful, then it's a good way of stepping in before you move to a flagship store. What it would take to, to make the collaboration worthwhile for everybody is to have a minimum of 10 brands to get started. And it would be a category-based store. So for example, 10 health brands within one health store, 10 beauty brands within one beauty store, and 10 food and beverage brands within a food and beverage store. So it's something that's not commonly known. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, Tmall are not so um, open to this as they used to be. It's still a possibility, but we do know that JD.com are open to this concept, and that's something that could be an opportunity for CBBC members who maybe don't have the budgets to open their own flagship store. And the other consideration is, What's the right option for your business? Direct shipping or the bonded warehouse option? And this is where if you do your own research and homework before you enter the market and find the right, right partner, then you can make the right decision for your business. So I hand back to Johan. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. We mentioned this before, you need some patience. Uh, China is big and different, so, so it would take, I, I, we haven't worked with any Brand, I would say, he make profit the first year. Uh, I would, and that's a global way of looking at e-commerce. It, it takes some time to, to reach profitability when it comes to e-commerce, same in China. Uh, local partner, we mentioned this many times, but local partnership and local marketing is really essential. All of the things we, <laughs> we are mentioning here today is, is important, but, but to do the local marketing, I would say, is number one in terms of importance. Uh, you, it doesn't really matter how many followers you have on Instagram, Twitter, etc. You need to build up this from, from zero in China. Of course, it's an advantage if you're a big brand and you're well-known worldwide. Chinese consumers are traveling and they, they can reach Facebook and Instagram. But, but you must build this also with the local social media and the local influencers. Uh, otherwise, you will not get the traffic. That's, that's how it is. Um, in terms of choosing the right partner, um, maybe the most common way for, for us at Aventura when we are entering a new partnership is that we are talking to brand owners who has been actually failing in China in terms of running their business. That can be maybe their own mistakes or, or quite common, the collaboration with the local partner. Um, so it's important to really find somebody who have similar agenda and are treating your brand. If you're a premium brand, you should treat it as a premium brand when it comes to branding and sales channels and marketing strategy. Uh, and it can go quite wrong here. Uh, and the, the, the list of, of failed projects in China is quite long. Um, so, so I can't really, this is super important. Compliance is uh, uh, maybe less sexy, but when it comes to cross-border, compliance is less of a headache. Uh, you can a little bit bypass the compliance regulations. Uh, that's the concept. But in certain categories, you need, for example, a local company with the local import license. So again, before you push the button, you need to find out the regulations for your category. Uh, the compliance might be a bottleneck also for you, even though you do cross-border. Kevin. Thanks, Johan. So considering these points carefully will significantly improve your chances of succeeding in China. So as Jan said, everything that we're mentioning is important, but these are the key considerations to take.
other considerations are the kind of challenges you face, what costs are related to setting up a cross-border e-commerce business, and also what are the opportunities. So again, another shared slide, I'll take the challenges and Johan will cover the costs and opportunities. So looking at the challenges, obviously China is a huge market, so where do you start in terms of market research? How do you conduct that? And which platform is the right platform for you? This is where the local experience really counts. Budgets can be a challenge. You know, it's, as Johan said, it's the long game. So you need to think about what budgets you're going to allocate, but also the right marketing budgets and strategies are very important because with China being so large, it's very easy to burn your marketing budget quickly, especially if you have the wrong strategy. And other challenges around brand protection, you know, we've heard many stories about um, trademarks and intellectual property and so on. Um, and also keeping the right side of the China regulations. Again, it all comes back to understanding this and the local knowledge and experience is what really counts. And this is why choosing the right partner is crucial. Johan's touched on it. I've come across it firsthand. There, there have been stories and some pretty bad stories about choosing the wrong partner, not having visibility of what's being sold, not even knowing, knowing what inventory is held on the ground if it's in a, a free trade zone warehouse or even a domestic warehouse. So that trust and transparency from your partner is, is obviously important, but it is or can be one of the challenges. Johanna, pass back to you. Yeah, uh, market research, we'll come back to that a little bit later here in, in the end of the presentation in terms of cost. We, we have a, a, an offer for you guys here today. But to build a store, um, this is, a, of course, a, one of the top questions I usually get, how much does it cost to do this in China? Um, if you look on the, on the TP, TP model, um, the TPs are usually charging both the commission, sales commission, let's say, depending on the category, but between 10 and 15 percent sales commission, uh, and then a fixed monthly retainer, uh, because usually the TP is assigning a dedicated team who is running your store. Uh, that can be store manager, designer, customer service. So depending on your size in terms of brand and how much budget you have in terms of marketing and how big your assortment is, uh, the team will be assigned accordingly, and the fee is then also charged accordingly. Uh, the, the platform, the marketplace fees, they usually, as I said, they have, uh, and you must you must pay a deposit to enter this one, the, the marketplaces, and that for legal matters. Usually, the money are there, and they, uh, nobody touch them until you leave the platform when when you close down the the store, and then you get the money back. And then most of the marketplaces have an annual fee, and usually you get that back if the sales is on a reasonable level. So that's a way to push you as a brand to, to invest and, and, and do good sales. Um, what else? Uh, marketing budget, it's really as easy as it usually is. The more budget you have, the more traffic you get. And hopefully the more traffic you have, the better sales you will, you will achieve. So uh, it's really case by case. What I would recommend you when you were to talk to a TP, uh, ask them to do a sales and marketing plan for the first year. Then you get a feeling about uh, how much the marketing is in percentage of the sales. Um, after a few years, the marketing spending should go down to around 15%. Many of you recognize this number as a benchmark number for all e-commerce, I would say. Same in China. Uh, in the beginning, it's of course much higher. Um, but after three, three years, it should go down to 15% of the sales. Uh, logistic can be, uh, Kevin, can be a percentage of the, of the sales or, or different business models. Of course, again, it doesn't. It's not for free to enter the cross-border landscape in China, but on the, on the upside is, of course, the huge opportunity to access almost soon one billion uh, Chinese consumer. I think 800 million today, um, and and that's uh, I don't know, is it two Europe or something like that? So so the opportunity is, of course, quite clear. You can sell a lot of products. Thanks, Johan. So moving on to logistics and helping you understand what you need to support a cross-border e-commerce business. So these are the four vital components which your logistics provider should be offering you. In terms of full supply chain management, 
managing your air and ocean freight, if uh, if you're outsourcing your warehousing and distribution, and also an experienced logistics team. So this slide illustrates what is required in both the UK and China, and it covers both the direct uh, shipping and the bonded warehouse models. So if you're doing the direct shipping, maybe the warehouse distribution center and fulfillment is your own, or if you're outsourcing, you will have a partner, and that's to support the one-by-one -one shipments. Uh, bulk shipments to China for the bonded warehouse model and taking advantage of any consolidation opportunities there. So your logistics provider should be making recommendations. Maybe it's um, you know shipping multiple products from multiple locations into one container, or maybe if it's the umbrella store, it's bringing together and consolidating multiple brands and multiple products into one container to make sure that you take advantage of the um, the best shipping rates. And also in the UK, they should be taking care of any exports and shipping requirements into China. And that will include all of the transportation modes, whether it's air and sea, which is the typical um, modes, but also rail freight is something that we, we see now and it's, uh, it's you know, predicted to grow, which, which we, we can definitely see. From a China perspective, Obviously, you need a company to receive the goods, manage any customs clearance that's required. And also, if it's the bonded warehouse model, then obviously the warehouse provider and then the fulfillment activities. The CIQ clearance, again, it, it, that goes hand in hand with any customs clearance. And also managing the last mile deliveries. So making sure that there's a good and reliable service there. And something that does get overlooked sometimes is the returns. How do you manage that? You know, if you're working with the right logistics partner, they will be able to offer you a, a good service. And something that the logistics partners should be offering you is the visibility within the supply chain. And that's really important because, you know, you want to be, um, you want to have peace of mind to know that your products are arriving safely, on time and to the right place. So that's something you should definitely be asking your logistics provider. What visibility do you have in the supply chain? We thought given the current situation as well, that we would share um, the impact of COVID-19. We know it's affecting the whole world. Um, China is now starting to, or uh, well, they've passed their peak. They're starting to come out of the crisis. So just looking at the, the China local, you know, what impact did it have in China? Well, all couriers and carriers were seriously affected, and that was mainly due to restrictions of deliveries from one city to the next. So you can imagine if you had a free trade zone warehouse in Shenzhen or Shanghai, and you were delivering goods into another city like Beijing, then there were issues related to goods being delivered to the neighboring cities. Um, that was pretty much forbidden. Fortunately, restrictions have been lifted since March and warehouses and couriers and carriers are now operating at full uh, capabilities. And just as a point of interest, goods from China to the rest of the world, ocean freight was operating as normal, but there were some inspections. Um, but one thing that did affect both ocean freight and air freight was that now 40% of all exports are being allocated for medical supplies. Because of the global demand for medical um, goods, then China is still a major global producer. So they're having to allocate a huge portion of the export capacity for medical supplies. Air freight was and still is limited. Uh, that's purely because there were less airplanes flying. So what we've seen there is increases in prices and very significant increases in prices. So the pricing at the moment is still very unstable for shipping goods in and out of China. And rail freight can also be a good alternative to air. It's, it's had a little disruption, but not as much as the, the air freight. So that covers most, if not all, of the practical or physical aspects of cross-border e-commerce. So what about the marketing landscape? And more importantly, how will Chinese consumers find your brand and your products. And this is absolutely Johan's area of expertise. So I'm gonna 
confidently hand over to Johan. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, uh, we mentioned this before. Uh, it can't be emphasized enough that the marketing part is really essential. We, uh, for the big brands, Chinese consumers most likely know you, but for, for medium size and down, uh, it would take some time before they, they understand your brand and your, your, your product. So um, when it comes to, to marketing and marketing budget, the two major components in terms of investments is, is uh, influencer marketing, similar like in Europe, that's it's a huge and a hot topic also in China. Uh, that's a big part of the budget. And another big part is uh, uh, buying keywords on the marketplaces, search engines. Both Alibaba and JD have similar, like Amazon, their own search engine, and there you can buy keywords connected to your brand and your category. Uh, but then also you need, um, Alibaba, for example, they, they encourage you as brand to drive traffic from outside of the marketplace into your, uh, to, the, to the Alibaba ecosystem. And then these five players here are, um, I would say the biggest five digital tools in China when it comes to this. Baidu there at the top, that's China's um, Google, the, the biggest by far search engine. Uh, you should spend a little bit of budget to buy keywords also there because consumers, they search also on that um, search engine, of course. Uh, if you go to the right, you have Douyin, uh, similar to TikTok in Europe, where you upload video related to Usually it can be related to your influencers, that influencers upload video on their account and drive traffic to your, to your flagship store. Weibo uh, daily posts, similar to Twitter, can be about more or less anything related to your business. Red is a fairly new platform, uh, focusing on reviews. So, so that's uh, very hot today, and as I said before, both Red and WeChat have their own uh, cross-border store opportunities nowadays. So you can both have a, like a social media account there, but also connect the store uh, to your red account. And same thing with WeChat. Uh, as a brand owner, it's, it's an absolute must. It's a hygiene factor today to have a WeChat account, uh, to build loyalty with your, uh, your followers. Um, so, so ideally you have some budget for all of these five players and you spend some time and money on, the, on a daily or weekly basis. To, to build up the brand and, and drive traffic end of the day to your online stores. So, so oh, that's a short summary of the <laughs> Chinese marketing landscape. Kevin. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is just an example of a few of a f some few brands we are working with in China today. Uh, what I would like to say with this one is when I came to China 10 years ago, the, the look and feel and design uh, was a little bit uh, messy uh, if, you, if you are if you have western eyes uh, today i would say it's quite different as you can see it's quite minimalistic and, and clean so um, brand consumers they are educated and they know how it looks like out also outside of china since they're traveling and searching online so don't overdo this too much um, copy paste what you have if you're happy with that uh, on with your western design and then do some smaller tweaks adjustments uh, in terms of look and feel Oh, uh, finally, from, from my side, um, we mentioned before that the market research is really essential. Aventura is actually a merger of two companies uh, last year, and the other half of the merger uh, has been doing China strategy and market research for the past 12 years in China. You can see uh, some of, of the reference cases on, on the right side. Um, so either with us or somebody, uh, make sure that you have your plan before you start your investments. Uh, who are your competitors? What say channel is su suitable for me? Should I work with influencers or should I work more with traditional keywords? And, and that dictates a little bit what sales channel you, sh you, you should set up your store at. Uh, the target group, the customers, what are they thinking? What are they doing? What do they provide to buy, etc. Uh, market size and also, lastly, some regulations uh, connected to your brand and your category. What to think about and what you must comply with uh, in order to sell to consumers. So um, we have here a, a discounted fee for all of the audience today, um, a, a standardized package to, to set up your uh, at least 1.0 China strategy. Perfect, very good Johan and uh, a very generous offer regarding the market research. So the next slide explains 
the Landers Aventura partnership and what we can offer UK brands who want to enter the China market. So by working together, Landers and Aventura, we can provide a complete end-to-end -end solution. And we also have a mutual interest with the brand owners. Everything we do is geared to deliver and drive sales because that's how we make our income. And we know that that's the priority for the, the brand owners. You get the benefit of working with two sets of experts, both on the logistics and the China e-commerce space. So peace of mind there. By working with us, you get to control your own brand experience because everything that we do is controlled by the brand owner. We can support you with the marketplace and social shopping platforms, as Johan explained. And whether you go the flagship store or the umbrella store option, again, we can help you with both of those steps. You get UK project management, but also the local China expertise, which we've covered is vitally important in terms of day-to-day -day execution. And if you do build a, a good business and you want to migrate to a domestic store, then this is where the build, operate and transfer model can really come into its own and we can help you with that migration. So effectively, what we do is we make it simple for UK brands to enter the China market. And this is made possible because of our knowledge and expertise. So that was very much a, a shameless pitch of the value that we can offer in terms of a solution. By working together, we can make what can seem a very daunting and complicated process very, very simple. So finally, just to summarize, uh, we've covered the, the routes to market in terms of the key steps you absolutely should take and the key considerations to make. We've covered the, the different fulfillment options, being the direct shipping or bonded warehouse model. We've explained and touched on a little bit about customs, tax and duty. But as I've said, there is a link on the final page of the, uh, the PPT, which you can follow and, and do your own homework just to get a better understanding of the regulations. We've covered logistics, both from a UK and a China perspective, and what you should absolutely uh, demand from your logistics providers, and touched on what COVID-19 and how the impact, um, what the impact was in China. And the opportunity for UK brands, it's, it's a staggering number, and it's a very exciting number. It's more than 800 million consumers. So great opportunity for picking the right partners and having that local experience and expertise on the ground is absolutely crucial. And this is where Arielandas and Aventura, with our solution, we can help you with an end-to-end -end service and effectively making it simple to set up and operate a cross-border e-commerce store. So thanks for your patience. I know we've covered a lot of content and thanks for joining the webinar. If anybody would like to have a more in-depth follow-up discussion with the Landers and Aventura, the My Contact Details are on the last slide of the PPT, or you can get the contact details directly from, from CBBC. So I think at this point, we're gonna hand back to Maxine and we're gonna open up to any questions. Hello again, thank you both so much. Um, another really great presentation and very comprehensive look at the whole process of CBEC and, and logistics and marketing in China. So that was really, really great. Um, I can see we're going to kick off the Q&A. We do have one question from James. And he says, for brands with a smaller budget, I've heard that you can sell through a WeChat mini program. How does this link to e-commerce sites like Tmall or GD.com? Yeah. Um... So, so I would say either you go on the marketplace, uh, flagship store marketplace, or you set up your, your mini program or your WeChat account. Uh, so, so there's like two different directions. And um, if you're a smaller brand, yes, it's more common to go with the WeChat option. Uh, less fees, less deposits. Um, and if your, your product, as I said before, is suitable for influencer marketing, you partner up with some local celebrity or micro-influencer, 
then you can get enough of attention and, and traffic to your WeChat store. But, but the, um, the challenge is to get the traffic to your WeChat store. Um, it's a little bit easier to get, to get traffic to, to, to a team on a global store. Right. Because WeChat store is like a closed network, I guess. So you need to... Exactly. Yeah, you need to follow, you need to follow the account in order to, to be able to communicate to your, your followers. Uh, so, so you can't really mass communicate. It's only peer to peer. So ideally, you'd want to have your e-commerce platform first, <laughs> and then. Well, uh, exactly. I mean, it'd be easier to, to get traffic to, to your open uh, flagship store on Timo Global. But again, if you have a good partnership with the local influencer, then they can help you to get the traffic to your to, to the WeChat store. So, so, so that's a crucial component uh, if you if you choose the WeChat direction. Right. Thank you very much. And a second question as well about the umbrella store. So how how does the umbrella store work? And can if I if I need to find like 10 different brands, how how do I do that? And what is does the page look like? So I, I think if we start with um, how you know you can find 10 brands, I mean th this is where that it is an opportunity, it's a collaboration opportunity. So you know whether the person who's asking the question knows other brands that would want to join in, or maybe through the CBBC member network, you know, we could do some promotion, some reach outs to the members. Um, but I, I think the key thing here is not so many people are aware that this model actually exists. So the big part is getting the communication out to the, the brands who could be interested. I've personally spoke to many small SMEs, once they understand the, the investment required to set up a flagship store, they very quickly realize we don't have those budgets. And I think that's where the umbrella store option could play a key part as that incubator. But it's a good question. How do you find those other brands to do the collaboration? And this is something maybe uh, the person who's asking the question, CBBC and the Landers could work together on in terms of raising the awareness, doing the reach outs to understand who could be interested within specific categories. So, you know, it, it, there's not a magic bullet in terms of how do you find the 10 brands, because but then it's a very good question. Um, but I hope that that answers the question. And I can ask Johan to explain how the umbrella store works, because Aventura yeah. uh, already have umbrella stores yeah. in place. So, so normally on marketplaces you have you have a you have a landing page like a start page of the store, and then you have one product page for each product. Um, and and the normal way is that consumers search on on Tmall or J this big search engine, and then when they click on on your product, they go directly to the product page. So so on the marketplaces, product pages are more important than the start page itself. So so of course each each product should have its own pay, uh, product page uh, with a lot of content, and then usually you present maybe the brand more at the bottom of the of the product page. So then you have the the big picture that this is the product, video pictures and reviews, uh, details about that. Uh, one comment there also that content is super important also in China. It's not enough with three or four pictures for one product. You need at least ten pictures for one 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 product. Uh, and then you also get a little bit information about the brand, the company behind the product at the bottom of the product page. So, so the product pages tend to be very long in terms of content. You need to scroll quite a lot. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention so that. That was from Hong and he says thank you very much. Or she, I'm not sure. Um, okay. And, but yeah, if, if any more questions about that, then we can do in the follow-up email. Um, but no, absolutely. So like you said, Johan, um, Chinese consumers like a lot of detail in, in product descriptions far more than what we're probably used to over here. So yeah, it's fundamentally different from what, what we expect from e-commerce stores as well. Very nice, very much. Yeah. Same with the Tmall account, I guess. Um, yeah, it's it can be quite expensive, even just the marketing budget for, for a small brand. So um, lots of things to take into account there. And yeah. I'm also very conscious it's now 25 to 11. Um, I know that people listening will probably have to head off soon, so we can wrap up there. And I can't see any more questions in the box. So if anyone has any more questions, please do send them now. <laughs>
Otherwise, um, as I said, we will be doing follow-up emails um, to everybody who has registered and also signed in to listen today. So if you do have any more questions, you can contact Johan or Kevin for the logistics side or the marketing side and to hear more about this opportunity with this um, collaboration between Aventura and Elanders. And yeah, thank you so much for your time, guys. Um, this has all been recorded, luckily for everybody. So if you want to relive it again, you can find it on the CBC YouTube channel. Um, and we will also be sending out some insight uh, summaries for all our webinars as well from this series. So yeah, thank you. I know it's evening in Hong Kong, so happy Friday. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So thanks to CBBC as well, uh, Maxine. Thanks to Johan for uh, for joining in from uh, from Hong Kong. And thanks to everybody for attending. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope everybody uh, has a really nice weekend and manages to maybe get outside for a bit and not go too crazy. Stuck inside. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, see you guys next time. Thank you all again. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. -bye. Bye.